song service. Do you want us to sing a song? Uh, I don't even know where a song book is, but uh <laughs> All right, I guess we'll sing Jesus Hold My Hand. Oh, my hand. 
shake hands with the folks around you, but not get out uh, wandering around because you're liable to trip on something. Uh, but uh, shake hands with the folks around you. Let them know we're glad to see them in church today. We want to say again that we're glad to have each of you here, and this is the beginning of something great. I'll just tell you that for sure. Uh, don't forget that we are going to have church tonight, uh, and uh, make plans to come, invite some folks to come. I was really tempted to go get the kids. I just got to thinking some of them probably will never get to experience a, a tent revival. And uh, I may do that after we get get sort of finished up here. Y'all may be seated if you'd like to. Uh, <clears throat> but we're glad to have you in church with us today. And uh, I, I know that there's uh, there's such a need for God's people to get together, to encourage one another uh, in the Lord, and also uh, to be encouraged by the Spirit of God. Yes, amen. Amen. Uh, we have to have physical food to survive with these bodies, and we need spiritual food even more than we need the physical food. And that's what's gonna be happening today and throughout this week. We're gonna have uh, every night, nightly, here the uh, tent revival, and then Thursday night, I mean Thursday in the daytime, we're gonna have a uh, uh, morning service, uh, a couple of preachers be preaching for us, and then uh, uh, have food afterwards, and then we're going to have the night service, and we'll have some refreshments after that. And then Friday morning, we'll have uh, the morning service with a couple of preachers preaching for us. And uh, Brother Taylor is going to be one of the speakers. Uh, Brother Smith will be one of the speakers. And uh, uh, I just I'm looking forward to God really doing something this week. Uh, I tell you how it happens. It's line up on line and precept upon precept. Uh, it's so hard for you to come just to one service and be to where that you can get your spirit opened up to where God can really do something for you. Uh, because I, I don't know how how the devil uses that to, to make people be to where that they just sort of withdrawn, but if you in service after service, you get to where you can just open up and let God do something great in your life. 
And I can just promise you, God has greater plans for all of you than you have for yourself. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I want to talk just a, a minute about Father's Day. Uh, we're in need so much today in this hour. Our nation is uh, it's going downhill fast. It really is. And uh, most of the people, I understand, about 70 to 80 percent of the people today are being raised without a father as a guide in the home. And I just say to the Christian father, that means that we've got to step up a little bit higher. And uh, what you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. If you're faithful to God and they can see that you're faithful to God, uh, they'll have more of a tendency to be faithful to God. But if they see that you're a little slack, men, and you serve in God and your faithfulness to church and everything, what you do in moderation, they'll do in excess. Or you've had a, a you wasn't faithful to come, they won't come at all when they get grown. Their their idea will be when I get out of here, I'm I'm gone from this because it's it's not real. So I just want to say to you dads, live the life for Jesus Christ with all of your might, because. This nation, if we have a place for our kids and our grandkids and great-grandkids to grow up to even have a glimpse of God, it'll be because of the men that sit in the church pews today that's really sold out to God. So I just encourage you to live for God. And uh, you ladies, we're, we're living in a time to where women are fighting for their rights. And that's not God's plan. God has a chain of order. It's the, the, the woman is to be a helpmate to the husband. And the husband is to submit himself to Christ. This is what the Bible said. And Christ submits himself to God. The chain of order is there. And I just tell you, ladies, you can make out of your husband what God wants him to be if you put effort into it. Amen. Uh, so, fathers, we say thank God for you. And if there's ever a time for you to pray and really seek God and be led of God, it's in this hour that we're living right now. Amen. Happy Father's Day to our, our men. All of you fathers, I'd like for you to stand. If you're a dad, I want you to stand. I'd like for us to give them a hand as godly men that's going to lead our nation. Hallelujah. Lord bless you, men. And we appreciate you, amen. Appreciate you for taking a stand for God. Uh, I spoke one Wednesday night on Foundation for Christian Living about that you have to be different. And boy, how, how true that is. And if you really take a stand for God, you will be different. Amen. amen. You'll, you'll expose to the world that there's still a God in heaven that's leading God in our lives. Amen. Oh, we appreciate you being here and at this time we're going to receive the morning tithe and offering give you opportunity to give if our ushers would come <laughs> Father we're grateful to, today for uh, the privilege that we can participate in giving. And Lord, I, I just uh, I say thank you that you've made some promises in your word. God, that uh, you would rebuke the devourer of those that are faithful with their tithes and their offerings. And God, I pray that you'd help every person here to hear that, that uh, passage of Scripture, what you've said. God, that you'd rebuke the devourer for their sake. But Lord, on the other hand, if we... If we steal from you, there's a curse that comes against us. And God, we don't want that curse, but we want the blessing. I pray, God, today that you'd help every person here that's a Christian. Help them, Lord, that they might be to where that they would apply that Scripture to their life and enjoy your blessings. Ask God that you'd bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen.
to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to thy name. that I need this thing. Uh, but uh, we do say thank you for your faithfulness in giving to God. And uh, I, I, had a, I had a man that uh, he wasn't a Christian when I was pastoring in Rose City, Arkansas. Uh, but he had come the first of the month and he would bring his tithes and give his tithes to the church. And uh, I talked to him about the Lord and and witness to him. And it took me uh, several months before I could lead him to the Lord. But he finally gave his heart to God and uh, was saved. But God blessed that man. And because of his faithfulness to God, uh, he got to see his sister saved. He got to see her husband saved. And they were old people that uh, had the privilege to lead them to the Lord. But God had directed him and given him guidance, even though he wasn't a Christian, that he participated in paying tithes to the Lord, and uh, God's blessing was upon his life, too. And I just say to all of you, and, and, and I tell people, our church, uh, we don't need anything. We really don't. God's, God's provided for us all these years. Uh, <clears throat> Talking, I was talking, I believe it was Brother Dave was talking about uh, this property, these buildings and everything, probably worth uh, close to $3 million, and we, we don't owe a dime. Uh, God has blessed us, and, uh, I, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm bragging on God for what I'm Amen. doing. Amen. But uh, I just want to tell you, uh, we don't reach out for money. We don't try to get money. But uh, you need to be faithful to God because it's you that you're the one that's either blessed or not blessed because of your faithfulness to the Lord. So I encourage you, uh, have faith that God will take care of you. Amen? Amen. 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 This is not, this is, this is some good stuff. You, you just don't really know. If you try God, He said, prove me. Hallelujah. Yes. And uh, he's got blessings that you ain't even thought about. One, uh, one of the blessings that I, I just I'm excited about is the Lord said He would rebuke the devourer. And my goodness, we got a little peach tree, and uh, it's made peaches one year. The frost has got it every year, but this year that thing is loaded down with peaches. But the uh, the squirrels love them peaches. <laughs> even though they're about that big. And there was a squirrel out there on that tree the other day, and I saw him, and I, when I opened the door a little bit, he knew he wasn't supposed to be there. And he run from that and jumped up on the side of another tree. I took my little air rifle, and we buried him. <laughs> I, me and the Lord together rebuked that devourer. <laughs> Oh, 
We're so privileged to have uh, Brother and Sister Bob's and and uh, their family, and and Lord, the Lord has uh, used them just abundantly in the souls being saved and lives being changed, and and I just encourage you during this time of the uh, the tent revival and the camp meeting to come to every service you can and open your spirit that you get everything you can because God has blessings for you that you hadn't even thought about. Uh, he, he wants every one of your lives to be better than where you're living right now. He really does. Uh, and, and I just I, I encourage you, get everything you can from the Lord. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Bob and he can just run it from here on ever high he wants to. I want them to sing some though because they're, they're excellent singers for sure. Thank you. I hate to prove you wrong right now. I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord for me. That's been the Lord's been mighty good to me. I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord. Make him more saved than me. Oh, yes, I think I'll take some time to praise the Lord for me. That's been the Lord's been mighty good to me. I think I'll take just a little bit. What I've got to do Did for my mother and did for my father Did for me and for you too I had so many ups and downs Seemed like the world goes round and round I looked at Jesus and then I fell My feet were bred on high and down I think I'll take, I'll take some time, some time to, to praise the Lord, the Lord for me Lord has been, has been the Lord did mighty good to me I think I'll take, I'll take just a little bit more time preacher was preaching how bad it was going to be on sinners in eternity and that scared me but I really was sick of sin yes. I didn't like the way it was treating me yes. I didn't like the way my life was always on the edge never could get ahead never could feel peace but he took me in praise God oh thank God he took me in and he brought me thank God he brought me a mighty long way him one more time. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you for letting us be here gathered with these people under this gospel tent. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is our daughter, Odie. Odie, testify. I love the Lord and I'm thankful to be saved this morning. I'm thankful for God's goodness and his mercy and he has brought me a long way. And as Brother Steve was singing earlier about Jesus holding our hand and protecting us and guiding us, I'm so thankful that I can look back over my life and I can see God's guidance and 
in my life when I don't when I didn't know which way to go. God was always there for me. And even when I didn't have the strength to call upon him, he was leading and he was guiding me. And sometimes all I could say was, Jesus, I need you. And he knew exactly where I was. He knew what I had need of. And he had the power to move in my life in a mighty way. And I'm so thankful that he's not a respecter of persons. That's not just for me or for here, but it's for anyone listening here t- today. God loves you and he cares about you. And I'm going to he loves us. There's never been any love demonstrated in humanity that can match God's love. And we don't love him because we're noble or because we're pure or because we're better than anybody else or because we're smart. We love him because he loved us first. Here in his love, not that we love God, the Bible said, but that he loved us. Oh, the mercy of a holy God to give His only Son who would bear the shame and consequence 
of wrongs that I have done. Courageous lamb who sought me out and he found me at my worst. Now I know I only love my Lord because he loved this mortal frame of dust and I will stand before God's throne to no longer peer through murky glass but I will know as I am known mine eyes will finally clearly see my God's transcendent and I'll love him best and most and last because he loved me first.
under the blue and white gospel tent this morning I want to take just a moment to say to the men that came and the women and helped yesterday to set the tent up thank you very much as you can see this could never be a one man show it takes too much work thank you for coming and joining in whatever you did is appreciated thank you for it I want to say thank you to Pastor Thomas for inviting us back we're glad to be here in this neighborhood, and I want to say to the people in this neighborhood that's, that are listening to me right now, we're here because this church loves the community that it's planted in. They're not here on the end of 4th Street by accident. They're here by the providence of God. When God made this land available and through whatever means made it appeal to Brother Thomas to buy and to build a church. None of that happened by accident. And in those early days of this ministry, God knew that on Father's Day 2019, there would be a blue and white gospel tent set up on these grounds and that people would be gathered under this tent and that men and women would be listening beyond this tent and that he would have a chance to extend his love right here in Colorado Springs in this neighborhood. I love the providence of God. I believe that so much. I believe God knew it then, and therefore God has good intentions toward us now. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for coming to church this morning. Turn with me to Luke chapter number 15. And I will also echo Brother Thomas and wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day. Uh, back, my dad lives in Ohio, and so they're two hours ahead. I waited till about 7:35. I sat down out here at about 9:35 there and called him. And uh, he's asleep when I when I called. I could tell. <coughs> so I said Happy Father's Day, and he I said, Aren't you going to church? He said, Yep. I'm ready. Even got my dress shoes on. I just leaned back here in the chair and went to sleep. Yes. Waiting on time to go. <laughs> and so I've talked to my dad and I've talked to my pastor at home and other men around this country that have had a fatherly influence on me. I appreciate men that God brought into my life. There were some things that because my dad was was not a Christian, there were some things that I did not learn from my dad, but there's a lot of great things that I did. Sure. And I learned some of those things from other men that God brought into my life, and I'm thankful for that. Yes. An older preacher told me not long ago, I was preaching for him, and he said I, I was trying to give some advice to one of my younger preachers, and he said, look, I want to I wanna pour into you. I mean, this guy's 80 years old, got... 50, 60 years of experience in the ministry. He's saying to this man in his 20s, I want to pour into you the knowledge that I have. And the young man said, I want to be my own man. I don't want to have your wisdom. And I thought, oh God, help that young man to see that we need somebody to help us. Amen. Right? I praise God. Sometimes my pastor did not advise me as gently as that pastor was advising that young man. Sometimes it was in the form of a pretty stern rebuke. And he'll still do it if I need it. And my dad will still do it. And I thank God for it. I thank God that he gave me a spirit to receive the instruction from godly fathers. Amen. From men that know more than I do, and there's a bunch of them out there. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So happy Father's Day. And I want to preach to you about the Father's happy day. The Father's Happy Day. Luke 15, verse number 11, is all I will read from my text, and then I will preach from this passage after we pray. And he said, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. 
a certain man had two sons. Would you stretch your hands toward heaven? Ask the Lord to touch us here in this place as we have church. Would you just sincerely call out to the Lord for us? Father, I pray right now you would captivate our hearts and minds here for a few moments. Drive out every hindering spirit. Lord, that wicked foul of the air that would steal your word from us before it has a chance to take root and grow. Bind him in Jesus' name. Oh God, give me liberty to preach your word to your blessed people, Lord. And give us liberty to receive your word, to believe your word, and to respond to your word. Not only these precious people under the tent, Lord, but precious people beyond the tent this Sunday morning. In Jesus' name we ask it, and everyone can say amen. amen. You may be seated. The Father's Happy Day. This passage is uh, part of a greater passage where Jesus is answering the accusations of the Pharisees. They were trying to provoke Him to a angry response when they said, This man receives sinners. In other words, this man must be a sinner because sinners like to be around him. And he does not give them an angry response. I'd like to be like Christ, wouldn't you? Do you ever feel like someone's trying to provoke an angry response out of you? Are they successful? They are sometimes with me. And I don't want to be that way. I want to give them a Christ-like response. He doesn't even answer them directly. He starts telling stories. Three stories about three items that are lost. The lost lamb, the lost coin, and the lost son. I want to focus today on this lost son. We call him the prodigal son. The son that wanders away from home. I want you to see, first of all this morning, that this boy did not wander away from home because he was lacking something at home. This boy had all that he needed at home. He was secure at home. Now, I realize, as the pastor was saying, we are living in a society where that is not true of many children in our society. They do not have security at home. Uh, Brother Jimmy Radcliffe uh, works with us some in tent revivals. He traveled with us all of 2016 when we were working in urban areas of cities across the United States. And he has a, he has a real burden for people who are hurting. He's about the best I've ever seen praying with people one-on-one -on -one who are battling uh, 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 abuse and misuse and maybe addictions of all sorts. He's just he's just got such a heart for people. And and one of the things he's involved in, he was texting me some about it this morning. They're having a a small camp uh, in his area, working with a boys' home this year. Just just eight or ten boys, and there'll be eight or ten men, and they'll have services where other people will come. But during the day, those eight or ten men are going to be working with these eight or ten boys. And I mean boys loosely. These are, these are young men. They're 14 to 18. They're, they're, they're almost ready to age out of the foster care system. And they're going to work with them this week. They're going to, they're going to change oil in a truck. They're going, to, they're going to build each of them a wooden toolbox and they're going to provide them with some basic tools and, and, and they're, going to, they're going to change tires on a truck and they're going to change brakes on a car and, and they're going to pack the bearings and just some basic things that many of us watched our dad do or our grandpa do but a boy that's been raised without a father he doesn't have a clue. And then there's going to be classes during the day on how to keep a finance, do checkbooks, and how to do this and that. All, you know, just stuff that we think people pick up through osmosis or something. You know, it just comes through the sky and they, and they learn it. But listen, there's people in this society 
that have never lived in a home where someone got up and went to work every morning. Yeah, that's right. Never. They don't, they don't know that's normal. There are people in this society that didn't have somebody that told them, you need to brush your teeth every day. Yeah. Now we think people, that's just gross. You don't know to brush your teeth, but nobody told them. They never told them you need to, you need to comb out your hair. You need to clean behind your ears. And, 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 and how many times did my mother tell me, clean behind my ears? Lord have mercy. It's the first thing I think of every time I get in a shower. Beat it into my brain. Don't just clean the front where everybody can see. But thousands, millions of kids have never had security at home. Yeah, true. And that's a... That really is a shame in our society, but it's the truth of our society. But I want you to see this boy was secure at home. He had everything he needed. He had a mama to teach him and a daddy to teach him. His mama had his daddy had a farm that he could learn to work and and oh, one of the greatest things that a boy can learn to do is to work. Amen. I was telling the pastor yesterday. Oftentimes when we're working under the tent, getting PA systems in and out, and setting a tent up and down, there'll be a couple teenage boys there, and I'll say, hey, help me with this. And I'll say, if, 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 if you can't do it, I'll get my wife, she'll do it. Now, if I was a teenage boy, that would have inspired me to push the other guy out of the way and do it myself. It don't inspire teenagers today, a lot of times. They'll step, step back and let Sister Kelly Joe jump in and do it. Oh, no, I'm not going to go there. But thank God for the privilege of being taught to work. Amen. You know, I didn't like working when I was a kid. It wasn't pleasant. I'd rather be at the lake. I'd rather be at the river. And the little Miami scenic river run through the little community a mile from where I was raised. And I wanted to spend all my time on the bank of that little Miami river. We fished. We swam, we played games, we climbed the bridges. I mean, that's as we lived down there. Just over from the river was a canal, and on the other side of the canal was a swimming pool. And man, that's what a kid wants to do during the day. And I did some, but my dad, he worked a lot of third shift, and he'd come in in the morning, 7:30, 8 o'clock, wake me and my brother up, say, "Come on, let's go to work." And I'm thinking, don't you ever sleep? <laughs> He'd get us started on the garden and he'd go sleep and we'd work in that garden and we'd mow the grass and he got up that afternoon we'd go over it and look at it and if it wasn't right we learned how to make it right and then we learned how we should have made it right and then we learned that we wanted to make it right <laughs> y'all got me yet <laughs> oh yeah and i often thought about some of my cousins that lived a mile through the field and never worked in the garden never mowed the grass never 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 washed the car and I envied them, but I don't now. Yeah. I don't now. There's been times in life that the only way to make it was to put my shoulder to the wheel and push it through. That's right. Amen. And I couldn't make enough money at one job. So you know what I did? I got a second job and sometimes a third job. And you just did whatever you had to do because that's what dad taught me to do. In fact, he told me, if you go to work for a guy and he wants you to plant tomatoes and he said, now you, you, you this guy says, now you dig a hole and you turn those tomatoes with the, with, the, with the leaves down and the roots sticking up. You make sure that's what he wants you to do. Then you plant every one of them upside down because that's what he told you to do. He taught me to work. Thank God for work. Amen. This boy had the privilege of living on a working farm. He, he was learning not only security for now, but security for his future. He had a good, good father. He was secure in everything he needed at home. But this boy got sick of home. Sick of authority. Sick of somebody telling him what to do. Sick of somebody telling him when to get up and when to go to bed. Sick of somebody saying that field needs to be hoed today and those cows need to be moved today and those sheep 
need to be put over there on that green grass and fence off around them today. He got sick of somebody ordering him around. And that really is a pretty good picture of how we are when we want to do our own thing and go our own way. Yes. And that's in all of us, isn't it? Yeah. I was a I was a pretty compliant child in a lot of areas. I learned to be a polite child even when I wasn't compliant inside. I learned to say yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no ma'am even if I didn't mean it. And that there was some profit in that. But even as a small child, I got a it's, it's, it's lighter and lighter as I age, but I got a, used to have a jagged scar right here on the middle of my lip right there. I don't remember much about it. I was just a little guy, just a toddler. Got out with my mom at some type of shopping center or something. It was nighttime. I do remember that. And we started to step over the parking blocks and my mom had my hand. And I jerked my hand away and said, I can do it myself like a kid will do. Right? All of our kids get to that point. And I, my little short legs didn't make it over the parking block. And my lip took the brunt of the fall. Now, I don't remember any of that except being told that, but I do remember some of my earliest memories of life are the bright lights and the doctor coming at me with a needle looked as big as New York. Stitch that up, numb me, and then stip it up. That's some of the first memories I have is in that doctor's office getting those stitches. Oh, I wish I'd have learned at two or three years old that I can't do it on my own. I wish I had learned that I'm not my own man and I'm not big enough to be my own boss. I wish I had learned that I need the security and the safety of my father. That I need somebody telling me what to do. That I need guidance. That I am not a world unto myself. Yeah. And I am not an island that can survive all alone. I wish as a toddler that first fall that I had learned that that, that authority and righteousness and goodness and walls and fences and rules were for my own good. Oh, but I didn't learn as a toddler. I kept jerking my hand away. And even though sometimes I would smile and say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, I was inwardly jerking my hand away, determined to do my own thing because I was sick of authority and sick of rules. I didn't want anybody's say over me. And that always leads us down a long, hard road. Can I preach to somebody here? Can I preach to to somebody under the tent? Can I preach to somebody beyond the tent today? There is a father that sets guidelines for us and we ignore it yeah. or we, at very best we ignore it or we're not completely aware, aware of it but at worst we rebel against it and say as I have done and millions of others have done, I don't want anybody ruling over me. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go my own own way. You know, it's cute the first time a two-year-old says, you're not my boss. It's cute the first time. <laughs> right? <laughs> Look at that. You're not my boss. And we get him to tell it again. What? Tell him what you told daddy. I told daddy, you're not my boss. Boy, but it's not cute at 16 right. or 18. It's not cute at 21 when they can't keep a job or they can't obey the rules or they can't stay out of jail or they can't make their payments because nobody's going to tell them what to do. Y'all with me here? Yeah, sir. This boy got sick of home. Sick of authority. And here's what follows that sick of home feeling. Selfishness. He goes to his father and says, Give me mine. I want my inheritance. Give me mine. Sick of home is often hand in hand with a selfish spirit. 
You know, all sin is rooted in selfishness. No one would ever steal if they weren't selfish. Right? No one would ever lie to save their hide or to make somebody else look bad if they weren't selfish. No man would ever try to lure another man's wife away from the home if he wasn't selfish. No woman would ever try to lure a husband away for herself if she wasn't selfish. Y'all with me here? Yes. Sin is rooted in selfishness. And this boy getting sick at home is hand in hand with, give me what I want. I want, I want joy. I want happiness. I don't want any sorrow. I don't want any consequences. I want thrills and no chills. I want gain and no pain. Y'all with me here? I want money and no work. I want things and stuff, and I want somebody else to pay for it. Give me mine. The lights of the city in the distance became his focus. I don't care what it says to mom. I don't care what it does to dad. I don't care that the older brother has to do my share of the work. I'm living for me and I'm going. Sick of home and I'm getting out of here. And that journey led down the unalterable, inevitable course to sin. The Bible said he began to be in want. He wasted his substance on riotous living. Now when we hear that, we think he wasted his money. And his money that was his inheritance was wasted. But he wasted his substance. That means he wasted his strength, his health, his integrity, his character, his youth. Oh God. Oh, if I could... If I could some way grab a hold of young people before they waste their substance and hold some of the rest of us up for them as a picture and say, look, you may get back to God, but do you really want to waste everything about your youth out there in sin? Can somebody give me a witness? Sin wastes us. It hurts our flesh. It hurts our spirit. It hurts our mind. It wastes us. Our reputation is gone. Our character is gone. The money that we lose is a very small part of what is really lost. This young man wastes his substance. He began to be in want, yet he's not really yet ready to admit failure. And so he finds a job, and the only job he can find is feeding the hogs. Now, here's this little Jewish boy. One thing his daddy's farm never had, and that was hogs. They didn't mess with swine. But here's this little Jewish boy feeding the swine. He's as low as he can go. I can just about see him asking the farmer, are you sure? Is there anything else I can do? No, boy. If you want a job, you get that slop bucket and you take it down there and you feed those hogs. He got down there feeding the swine and he is so destitute and he is so tore up and he is so low down that he wants to eat from the husk that are going to the swine. Uh, I got to ask this. Has anybody ever slopped hogs? Or watched somebody slop hogs? Now, my grandparents lived in a log cabin in Kentucky. Grandma cooked on a wood stove. And over there behind that wood stove was a tall metal bucket. Slop bucket. It's taller than a... I think, I think we got a five-gallon plastic bucket sitting back there, like a paint bucket or something. Must have been narrower, or maybe it was more gallons. It looked taller. And when breakfast was done, all the dishes scraped in there. Milk that was left, water that was left, coffee that was left, juice that was left. And I've seen Grandma sometimes go get a pitcher of water 
Pour it in there, thin it down some. True. That bucket be almost full. She'd call for us grand grandkids. Grandpa's down at the hog lock, come get the slop bucket. And so we go get that bucket, <coughs> trying not to puke. <laughs> Y'all with me? Yeah. Yeah. Like a garbage disposal. <laughs> Five or six gallons full. As soon as I get out the side door, you hear Grandpa calling up them hogs. See? See? He'd say. I don't know what that means, but here they come. <laughs> Those hogs would run up to that homemade trough slop bucket. It was a log hollowed out. The Grandpa had built no telling how many decades before. Those hogs be in there with their noses and their front feet. They wouldn't even get out of the way once the slop started getting in there. They'd just jump in there and he'd just pour it on top of their heads. Pour it in there and other hogs that couldn't get in the trough come around eat off the top of their heads. I mean, they just say to eat like this is the last meal they're ever going to get. Yeah. Or the first meal they'd gotten in weeks. That's why I always told Odie, told Odie, she wrote it in my Father's Day card this morning, I love you better than a hog loves slop. That's where I learned what real love was, man. They love that stuff. Us kids are over there, man, we're fascinated. We're, we're over there dry heaving and fascinated that they love that stuff. And here is a man that's so busted, so disgusted, so poor, so destitute, he'd love to get down there and eat with them. But he didn't have permission. No man gave him permission to eat from the hog's food. And here comes a feeling that he had never felt before. Remember, he was secure and safe at home. And then he got sick of home. And all of a sudden, as the Holy Spirit whispers in his ear and says, it's better than this back home. Even your dad's servants have bread enough and to spare. Are you listening to that? That's the voice of the Holy Ghost talking to him in the hog pen. That's the, that's the God, part of the Godhead that chases us into the muck and the mire of sin. And he says, the, the servants at home are eating and they're not even going to be able to eat everything on the table. They're going to have leftovers and you're here starving. And a feeling that he had never felt before came over him. He's no longer sick of home. He's homesick. He's sick to go home. If I could just go back, I'm going to tell you, friend, a lot of people come to this place if I could just go back. And that's as far as they go. But I come to preach to somebody, you can go back. I said you can go back. You may not be able to fix everything. You may not be able to take back every word you said. Some relationships may be so broken that they can never be fixed, but you can go back home and do the best you can with what God gives you. If you just get home sick, sick for peace, sick for joy, instead of being sick of the Father, being sick for the Father. If I could just go home again. I come to preach to somebody here on Father's Day, you can go home again. I said, you can go home again. He rises up and comes up with a speech. I'm going to go home and say to my father, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned. The things that I have wanted have not satisfied me. And I'd love to come back home. Now, Father, here's what I come up with. Could you let me be a servant? I'll live in the servants' quarters. I'll eat the servants' food. I'll do the servants' work. I just want to live close to home. He had this speech made up. He walks all the way home, rehearsing that speech in his mind. Anybody ever do that? Yeah. You got that big, you got that confrontation. You know it's going to be big, you know. And so guys on the way home from work, you're rehearsing your speech. 
You didn't leave on good terms that morning, so you're getting it all in your mind. You get home and she opens that door, you're going to spill it all out, right? You rehearse it. Or maybe you got a conversation with your boss and you rehearse it in your mind over and over and over with your kids or with a co-worker. He's working, working it all over in his mind as he's walking home. He's, he's getting pretty close. He's just got to top this one hill. But at the top of that hill stands a man that he recognizes. It's his father. His father has been waiting for him to come home ever since he left. Now, he wasn't expecting that. And here we have a picture, the only picture in the Bible that we have when God gets in a hurry. It's the only time we ever see God in a hurry. When the Father spots that Son walking to Him, He runs to meet Him. He doesn't let Him come. He runs to Him. The Father runs to the Son and embraces Him and hugs Him and kisses Him and calls for the servants to bring a robe and a ring and shoes and kill the fatted calf and let's have a celebration because my Son has come home. Praise God. It's the Father's happy day when a Son comes home. I want to point out for you, we never read about the son's happiness at home. It's not in the story. No, we know he's happy. That's, that's all a given. But the story's focus is on the father's happiness. The son needs to come home. The son does come home. But we don't read anything about what he feels, what he thinks, what he says. It focuses on the Father and what he thinks and what he feels and what he says. When we come home, the Father is more happy than we could ever be. Yes. Yes. When we come home, the Father is waiting, willing to run to meet us. It is the happiest day when the Father sees the Son come home. Yes. We often say when someone comes and gets saved, the angels are rejoicing in heaven. And they probably are, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence yes. of the angels. <laughs> Who else is there? It's the Father. <laughs> Y'all with me here? Yeah. I, don't, I don't mean to ruin your favorite song or anything. You know, I'm just telling you, the angels probably are rejoicing, but that's not what the Bible says. Am I right? Amen. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. The Father is rejoicing when someone repents and comes home, gets so homesick that they slide into home and they're safe, praise God. Safe from sin, safe from heartache, safe from the pain of this old world, safe and ready to go to heaven. And the Father rejoices. You've all heard the old story, or a lot of you have, of the boy that constantly fights with his father. And at one point, he raises his hand to even strike his mother. And the father sends the boy out. Get out. Don't ever come back home. You'll never strike your mother. And the boy goes into the world and lives a miserable life. Stays gone a number of years. But he gets homesick. Can, can I just stop right here and tell you, that's a beautiful feeling when you get homesick. Amen. Now, when it comes to being homesick in this world, you know, I just got to confess to you, I'm not real familiar with that feeling. We live our life on the road, and that's home. As long as I know that's close by, I'm okay. People ask me where I'm from. I say I'm Ohio. I'm from Ohio, but don't hold it against me. Everybody's got to be from somewhere. And I got a mommy and a daddy and a pastor and family at home. And I do miss them after six or seven months. I go home for three or four days. I'm ready to go again. I guess God made me that way so I could do what I do. But I do remember the feeling of being homesick for heaven. 
homesick for God. And when I'm talking to people and their minds are messed up and they're weeping and they're saying, Brother Davey, I'd just like to have some peace. I'd just like to have some joy. I'd just like to be able to lay down at night and sleep without these pills, without this, without this alcohol. I'd just like to be able to get rid of all these horrible memories in my mind. It's a feeling that I recognize as homesickness. And it's a good feeling to have because if you'll get up and go home, the Father will be running to meet you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. This boy in this story, I was I telling you, traveled and roamed the roads for years and got homesick. Thought he'd write a letter to mom and dad. Told him where he'd been, told him how he felt. He wanted to come home. He said, but you told me never to come back and, and I want to honor you. What I'll do is I'll take the train. The train track comes by your house before it stops at town. If there's a if there's a rag in the limb of that old tree out by the train track, just tie a limb up there. If that rag is there, I'll get off at the stop and I'll come back home. If it's not, I'll go on. I'll never bother you again. He got to telling somebody on the train about what he had done, and he said, "I can't even I can't even bring myself to look out the window. I just know there's not going to be anything tied in the limb of that tree." And so the other passenger looked out the window as they went by, and that tree had a rag on every limb. Yeah, at the top, at the bottom, there's a rag on every limb. You know what that says? Come on home, son. Come on home. Daddy going to be happy when you get home. Can I preach to somebody here? You may have never really known the love of an earthly father. You may have been cheated out of that security and safety at home. But there is a heavenly father that loves you this morning and is waiting for you to come back home on Father's Day. Yes. Look at this tent. Look at this equipment. Look at these people and the preparation they've made. It's a simple indication that the Father is waiting for you to come back home. So much so that we prepared for you to come back home. There is an altar for you to kneel at. There is a prayer for you to pray. And that prayer is something like this. Father, I want to come home. I confess my sins. And I want to be your child. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of all the stuff. I'm tired of all the sin. All the confusion. I'm ready to come back home. You pray something like that, friend, you're going to find he was already running to meet you. Yes. Are you praying with me, saints? Oh, hallelujah. Under this tent and beyond this tent, there is a Father reaching for you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he wants you to come home safe. I said he wants you to come back home safe. And today is the day to do it. Would you bow your heads with me, saints of God, under the tent? I want to pray with those of you that need to come home. Those of you under the tent and those of you beyond the tent. You're not second class people. Because every one of us wandered away from home. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to know some of the things I've said, places I've went, people I've wounded. I wouldn't want you to know the heartache that I experienced and that I caused in the far country. What I would want you to know is I woke up one day and said there's a better life than this. And the Father drew me home. And I've been living in His pleasure, in His peace. And I can tell you that's the better life you really want 
and need to come home. If you can leave the place where you are, if you're listening on your porch, if you can come under this tent, that's awesome. If you cannot, you make an altar right there where you are. And you tell God, God, I want to come home. I'm sick of this life. I want to be a Christian. I want to be your child. I want to be loved. And I want to love. And I want to forgive. And I want to be forgiving. Listen, God can do a transforming work in your life right there where you are. And if you're under this tent, in a few moments... I'm going to ask you to come toward the front. You can either sit down on these seats. You can kneel at the altar if you're able. You can stand. And brothers and sisters in this church will be right here to meet with you and to lead you in prayer and help you pour your heart out to God because all of us were in the same place at one point in our lives. You don't have to be hesitant. You don't have to be embarrassed. We have all walked that road. I'm going to ask you to stand, and then I'm going to ask you to come toward the front. Will you do that with me, saints? If you're physically able, would you stand to your feet? And would you make your way down to the front? Saints, would you make would you just you just lead the path? Saints of God, children of God, and others that need to come will come as you are coming. Come on, you don't have to be embarrassed. This is for 100% of us, young, old, visitors, home folks, people that have never been here before, people that's been around here for 40 years. It matters not. This is for everybody. Come on, this altar's open. The saints are praying for you. Oh, yes. Come on back home. Come on back home. God's reaching for you. God's calling for you. Yes. Of love and mercy, you wonder. But still you're searching oh, for someone who understands the pain you've been through. Oh, the Father waits oh, to yes. God, I want somebody to help me. He's calling come on, let's pray with those that come. You know who's regular here and who's come not. Come on. Come on. Come on. Home. Lord, I want to be you saved. I want to be home.
service at this point, Pastor Thomas, the saints of God, are going to offer to pray for people that have special needs. You came with a burden on your heart. You have a wayward child that's about to drive you crazy. You have a financial need, a physical need, a diagnosis from the doctor that you don't really know what to do with. We believe God heals and God helps. And, and my daughter often says this, and there's no magic to it. There's, it's, the, it's, it's not something that's, you know, hocus pocus, but under this tent, it just seems like people sometimes reach out easier to faith and touch God. Many, many, many miracles happen when the saints of God gather and pray for one another under a gospel tent. And so we want you to just come right now. If you have a special need, and, and these pastors and the saints of God will anoint you and pray for you and the family of God will gather around and be the family of God because that's what we are, right? If we're not family, we're wasting our time. This is the family of God and we love one another. We're willing to go to battle for one another. Sister Thomas needs a miracle. Let's pray for her.
are God. That you heal, that you save, that you deliver. Oh, trust in that.
under the tent. Pastor made a really good point. It's building service upon each service. Tent revivals gain momentum as they go. That's why back years ago, tent revivals would run five, six, seven weeks. And I, and I realize our society is not ready for things like that nowadays, but that was the reason they built, momentum built. More people heard and came and faith was lifted up. Many, many, many times the greatest results were in those last few weeks and days of those meetings. So we've just got a few days. Let's make the most of it. Every night at 7, we appreciate you coming. Be under the tent with us this morning. Why don't we just stand and thank the Lord for His help. For the privilege to come and for His help as we've been here. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what we've seen, what we've felt, what we've heard. Thank you, Lord, for what people are taking home with them. We praise you for it, Lord. Thank you for the work that you did outside of this tent and under this tent that we're not yet aware of. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you made any kind of commitment to the Lord, either here or at your seat, at some point, speak to Pastor Thomas or Pastor, one of these Pastor Thomases here. Speak to them because they want to help you. They want to come alongside you. They want to make sure you have a Bible and that you understand the commitments you've made. And so if you've made a commitment, let them know. Speak to someone about it and testify to it. We're made overcomers through our testimony. Speaking it. God did a work in my life and I, I responded to it. God bless you. Free to go.